this session, now hear this, putting voice, video, and text into Rails. Um, a quick introduction, my name is Ben Clay. I'm actually very proud to be from the state of Atlanta. Welcome. Hope you all have enjoyed Atlanta so far. You may also know me through some of my open source contributions. Um, just a quick show of hands. Has anyone heard of the gear tool? Awesome. Has anyone used it? Come on. All right, cool. Um, I'm not going to talk about a gear tool today, but I do want to just quickly mention it because it bears some relevance to the talk. Um, and here is a open source framework for voice applications. So you can think of it as uh, you know, Rails is for the web, and Yurjin is for, for voice and for uh, real time communication apps. Uh, I'm also the founder of a company called Lingo Lingo, based here in Atlanta, and this is what we do. We work with voice applications. Um, you know, we build them, we scale them, we uh, do usability, but this is, a, this is a, a topic close to my heart. I find communications applications in particular very, very interesting. All right, today I want to tell you why the web is a lot like outer space. Because on the web, uh, no one can hear you scream. So let me let's paint a, a scenario. So imagine you're at work and you're, you're working with your app, and all of a sudden something happens and you realize you need to speak with one of your customers. Now, what most of you are going to do is you're going to pick up a telephone. And the main problem with this is that when you pick up that phone, any communication that you have is now outside of your business process. It's not noted within the business application, it's not recorded. Um, the fact that the call happened uh, is in no way, in most cases, is in no way reflected in the state of whatever you're doing for your customer. Um, and also, the, the, the communication itself is fairly limited. You've, you've got this really kind of crappy, narrow band audio signal to talk through. Um, you can't easily share pictures, you can't easily share links. You really don't have a very rich communication experience. Would it be cool if we could, instead of having that phone call happen outside of the app, put the communication right into the application itself? Would that be cool? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that brings us to something called WebRTC. So, another show of hands, has anyone heard of WebRTC? Cool. That number goes up every time I ask, which is absolutely a happy thing for me to see. Uh, has anyone actually tried it? A couple? Okay. Well, hopefully, at the end of this talk, I'll have some resources for you that will inspire you and give you some information on how you can try it. Um, but for those who aren't familiar, WebRTC is fundamentally about audio, uh, getting the speaker, the microphone, and the camera in the browser and making use of that in a web application. So what is it? It is the camera and the microphone, but it's without any plugins. This means that if you want to go build a real-time communications app, you want to take advantage of the mic and speaker for some kind of uh, app. You don't actually you, you need a flash, you need a Java. Um, and all of the, the bad things that come with having plugins such as crashes and ICQ you know, and go away. It's built right into the browser. Uh, WebRTC additionally has functionality built in to establish peer-to-peer -peer connectivity between two or more parties. And this is really an interesting point, which I'll touch on more in a minute, but uh, connectivity across the internet can be really tricky with that firewalls and things like this. So WebRTC has functionality built in to help traverse uh, uh, connections and firewalls. And the last thing it provides uh, is a common set of codecs for actually exchanging high-definition media. So I'll talk about more about that in just a second as well. Um, it, so fundamentally, it is a WebRT, a JavaScript, WebRTC is a JavaScript browser API. You tend to access it using JavaScript objects built in the browser. Um, it can also be used for mobile, although in, in the mobile world, what you get are all of the backend pieces. You get the standardization of the network traversal, but you don't necessarily have the same API. It's different as different SDKs are provided. I'm not going to talk too much about mobile today. But the standards for interoperability are really interesting. So these codecs, Opus, V711, H264, VP8, um, these are what make very high quality audio and video possible on the internet. Uh, G711 aside, which we really, really care about, Opus is really a pretty amazing codec. It, it comes from a lot of research, including uh, significant contributions from Skype. If any of you have, probably most of you, have made Skype calls, and you notice just how good the audio sounds. Opus builds on that research and actually goes further. Opus, as a codec, is good enough not only to transmit voice efficiently, which is to say, um, using minimum amount of bandwidth to preserve the highest 
with all the employees. It actually can scale up and also transmit music. So it's a very, very high quality codec. It's built in the browser, no royalties. I mean, if everyone has ever dealt with licensing codecs, you know what a giant pain it can be. Opus is entirely royalty free. Um, 264 and VPA are two competing standards for transmitting video. Um, 264 has been around a while, it's, it actually is patent encumbered, although Cisco has paid for licenses so that open source software like Firefox and, uh, and eventually Chrome will support 264. VPA is actually a codec that Google acquired a company and then released all of its IP. So it's a fully open, uh, open standard, open license codec for video. And that's very exciting because that means that we'll be able to do video without paying royalties eventually. It's still being bought out for it. But these, what these do provide you built into the browser is very, very high quality audio and video. There are a few more alphabet soup type things that are built into the standard. SDP is the mechanism by which the two endpoints exchange information about where they are. Um, I stud in turn, these are the uh, protocols used to traverse the firewall. And then DTLS SRTP is exciting because it is uh, basically on by default encryption. So all of your calls will be, all the media on your call will be encrypted. So finally, just to kind of sum, what is WebRTC? A lot of people in the telephony industry get really excited about the idea of putting a telephone in a web router. And please, if you take one thing away from today, do not take that away. The idea isn't to put a telephone in a web browser because we, we can do so much more. The web is, is a rich palette uh, of, of user interface possibilities. So think of it instead as communications in a web browser. Uh, and a quick note on the relevancy of WebRTC. This is a chart compared by, this is the only uh, pundit chart I've got this whole talk. Um, Dean Bubbly put together this chart projecting the adoption <coughs> rate of WebRTC. And the gray line at the bottom represents browsers. And we're pretty much hitting that point today where it's about a billion, a little over a billion browser-based, uh, desktop browser-based devices that support WebRTC. The interesting part is the growth of tablets and smartphones, because these communications options won't just be in the browser, they will also be on mobile devices, whether that's mobile web or native to apps. Eventually, coming very soon, there will be a lot of WebRTC and mobile devices out there. Okay, so before we go further into WebRTC, I want to just give a real quick background on communication topologies. So this is how communications are facilitated today. For most of you pick up a phone, you know, you, you might have your service through AT&T. When Alex wants to call Bob, she'll pick up the phone, she'll dial, that signal will hit AT&T, AT&T shoots over Verizon, Verizon sends it back down to, uh, to Bob. Um, this is called the traffic zone. Pretty classic. That really relies on every subscriber having a relationship and then all of those um, carriers being federated with each other. The advantage of this is that everybody can call everybody. We have one set of phone numbers and generally, as long as all of the carriers federate, everyone's regional. Uh, but there are a lot of problems with that. Because of the overhead that comes with all of that federation, there's a lot of innovation that gets lost. Uh, you just don't move very quickly when you have to coordinate companies all around the world. And, and then not to mention devices and users handle all around the world. Um, also, it's, it's not particularly user friendly. If you think about identity in the form of a cell phone, your identity is your phone number. But that's the least, it's 10 random digits that are assigned to you by your phone company that really mean nothing to you. And yet we come to be associated with this identity. So this architecture has some significant drawbacks. The next kind of architecture is more like a triangle. And Skype's a good example of this. So you have one central service, and you have uh, endpoints that connect to it. Now this, these guys were able to innovate a lot faster because they controlled both the network and the endpoints. So we got things like video, we got things like high definition calls. Uh, we have plenty of usernames, usernames that we actually picked in the process of signing up. But there's still two things that are <clears throat> problematic with this. One is that it's essentially a wall garden. You know, I can't build an app that integrates with Skype all that well. I certainly can't base Skype into my business processes. Now, which means, the second problem is it's not very contextual. I still have to go to a separate service, I still have to go to a separate application to actually handle my communication. It's not, it's not based on my business process. So with WebRTC, we actually get to do something that looks more like this. You still, we, you see we get to keep the standard, the triangle, the thing is actually a more perfect triangle. Um, because what's happening here is the signaling goes back to the website. 
So again, I don't develop any plugins. I just go to the web application, and it serves me all of the tools I need to uh, to enable this new face right now. So, uh, and then secondly, the, the signaling and the media are separate. So what happens is when that call wants to be set up, Alice will send a request which just contains her information to the web service. The web service will share that information back to Bob. But let's imagine you have a firewall here. The media actually is exchanged behind the firewall. So this has some really interesting implications for performance. This has some really interesting implications for quality. If you are on a low bandwidth link, um, Maybe you're in a, I was actually working in Barbados once and the internet connection off the island went dead. So we, we had connections on the island, but not connections off the island. We actually could still communicate um, because all of the media was exchanged locally. So that we, we're, we're not using expensive bandwidth round trips, you know, across uh, congested links. All of the video was being passed on the land, even though the session setup could be elsewhere. So let's dig a little bit further into how a WebRTC session set up my book. So we'll start with Alice using Firefox. She is going to send uh, a request to initiate communication with Bob. That request contains something called an SDP, a session description protocol. For practical purposes, just think of it as a opaque blob of text. But this blob of text contains a bunch of things, which include her contact information in the form of an IP address and a port. It contains a list of the codecs that her device supports, this being one of our PC that will this will be page 264. Um, and it contains as well her uh, a, a public key that can be used to encrypt communication being sent to her. Now the web server doesn't have to do anything with that blog. Again, it's just okay. All it really has to do is forward that on to the recipient, in this case, Bob. So Bob, upon receiving that uh, offer, generates his own response, containing largely the same information and passes it back uh, via the web service to Alice. Now, at this point, a whole bunch of packets start flying between Alice and Bob, starting with ice, and then stun, and then turn. So what those three things do are, ice in particular enumerates all of the network interfaces that you have. So you might have a LAN, you might have a VPN. It will also ping out to the internet and figure out what your public IPs are, and it will use all that information to try to tell Bob how Alice can best be reached. If they can make a direct communication on the LAN, great. If they can't, because of the separate firewalls, maybe we'll, we'll do something, we'll try to uh, pierce through the firewall, that's where the stun comes in. Um, and worst case scenario, if they can't make direct communication, either locally or using stun to reverse the firewall, then there are relay servers called turn servers that will actually uh, proxy the media. They'll actually just uh, receive from one party and pass it right to the other party. Now, because they've exchanged private keys using the signaling layer, what will actually happen is the media will be encrypted. So even though the turn server technically is in the pouch, the media is in the worst case scenario, all that audio is still encrypted. The turn server can't see it, can't do anything about it. It's, it's just data being passed back and forth. So this baked in security is, is one of the big things uh, with WebRTC that is, uh, I think, relevant given our friends at the NSA who would like to jump into all of our conversations. Um, properly deployed WebRTC is one stop for being able to see into that communication. Um, one other point I want to make about signaling is I've used web servers as my example, but uh, it really doesn't have to be web servers. All you have to do is get that SDP in the point of view. We've done deployments with XMTP as a carrier, or uh, some messaging. Um, we can do it with Redis. I've even seen an example where someone actually took, took it, put it on a text file on a USB drive, carried it to the computer, and loaded it back in, which is the least efficient way I could possibly manage to set the call. But it does work. <coughs> Alright, so that's enough about the plumbing. Um, what really gets me excited about the applications is how we use it. So, I've, in the last couple of years of building these applications, I've thought about what it takes to, uh, to build these apps and what, what, the, what uh, attributes application like this should have. So I came up with five <coughs> tenets that I want to share that you should consider when designing communications applications. So a modern voice application should be adaptive, which to me means that it should uh, take advantage of the capabilities of various devices on which it's running. It should be fluid, which is to say it should be able to move across devices and across time and even across users uh, and still preserve the context of the conversation. It should be contextual, because really this is the value 
of what you're building, the communication happening in context with whatever application it supports. It should be trustworthy because the worst thing in the world is to communicate something sensitive and then have it revealed, or otherwise it can't use trust. And the last point is that it should be referenced. So let me go a little bit more to each of these. Adaptive. What does it mean to be adaptive? So if Alex, again, is on Firefox, she has a pretty broad range of options available. She has a keyboard for input. Um, she obviously can send text back and forth. She's got a microphone, a camera, and speakers. She can really have a very rich communications interface. And maybe she's talking to this guy over here who's on his iPad with a very similar set of input options available. So whatever app we build for them might enable video conversation, audio conversation, text, link sharing, all that. Now this one wants to join the conversation as well. If she's on a smartphone, and this particular smartphone either doesn't have a camera, or maybe she doesn't have enough bandwidth, or maybe not a battery to support a video screen. So she still wants to participate in the conversation. She still wants to um, talk about whatever the issues are. Well, she can still both receive text messages if, if we have a, um, send and receive text messages if we have a mobile app in play. And she can also participate by audio. So think of this sort of as your conference call, where some of the people have a side channel where they can use video with, with richer communications, um, whereas this third party really is only in by voice, but critically, she is able to participate. The same is true with this poor guy. I don't even know where he's on that phone. That thing is ancient. Um, but he can, still, he can still join it, right? He can still talk. And then we have this last guy who, who also has a browser, but either his microphone is broken or maybe his baby is asleep and he doesn't want to talk. I mean, I've, uh, actually, I've worked with a guy who's in Milan and he's six hours ahead of us. So a lot of times we'll have calls or after his kids have gone to bed and he's, he's always muted and he doesn't want to talk. So we'll say something and if he, has, he wants to feedback, a lot of times we'll just write something into our, our side channel. So an app that's adapted will enhance or degrade gracefully uh, based on the capabilities and choices that users make. That's, that's what being adapted is all about. All right, let's talk about being fluid. So, text or conversations often start, especially today, with chat. I certainly don't, if I want to reach out to somebody, the first thing I do is not pick up my phone, in a lot of cases. At least if it's a coworker, it's not. Um, I, I would like to start with chat. I want to see where they are. I want to maybe I can ask a question asynchronously. I just want to see if, if he's available. But at some point, chat becomes too cumbersome, so we'll switch to audio. So I want to be able to click a button that enhances that conversation from the same conversation, the same context, from chat to audio. Maybe I want to pull a couple more people in because this discussion is getting bigger. We want to maybe invite a customer. Maybe we want to invite someone from another department. Uh, upgrade the video because some things, whether the picture tells a thousand words and the video tells that 20 words in a second. But then when we're done, we should be able to go back to chat. And the, the flow here is that this is still one conversation. And I think Skype does this very well. If you've ever had a Skype conversation where you started uh, chatting and then went up to video and then back down, you can kind of see all that in the history of the conversation. And of course, frankly, being able to switch devices. This is a big one. And, and not everyone really gets this right. Again, I want to give Skype credit for this. Uh, if, if I'm at my desk and I need to leave, I can actually transition that call to my mobile fairly easily. Okay, being contextual. This is my favorite of five. <coughs> a friend of mine, Jeff Onworth, has this really great book that in the future, communicating isn't what you're going to be doing. It's what you're doing while you're doing something else. <coughs> this idea that we have dedicated communications devices, I think is, is I say, I think it's done. I mean, even all of us, the phone that we carry isn't primarily a phone, it's everything else, right? So being contextual is all about getting context into the conversation, or putting the conversation in the context of this app. Um, these are just some sort of, not entirely random examples, but examples of information that may be useful to a conversation. So, how many callers are waiting in the queue if you have a, a contact center? Or how, many, how much have we sold so far this month? Um, I like the one that says, add my manager to this call, because it implies not only that uh, the, the manager can be easily added to an existing conversation, but the, the business relationship is understood by the application. So if I, if I make a request, I say my manager, the application is who I am, who's my manager is, who's how to reach my manager, and then actually add some to the conversation. You can see this in text as well. So a good multimodal app that's contextual not only will facilitate 
the direct participants of the conversation, but also third-party services. In this case, you can see that we were talking about, it looks like we had a problem with asterisk, but you can actually see that uh, notifications from New Relic were being pushed directly into the conversation. So that just gives everybody else more visibility about whatever the problem is we're trying to solve. This is a great example of really business-specific information. So in this case, I made a, a conversation, uh, and I just, when I sent this message, all I typed was, I want to know about A, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. What the application did is it actually went back, it, it understood that that was a special string uh, hashtag, so to speak. And it actually looked up that information from the database and then rendered some information in line. So this conversation now has not only what I said, but the context about what I said with very little effort. So this makes all of that communication much more fluid. Everybody's on the same page. So the fourth one, a communications app absolutely has to be trusted. Users don't trust it, they won't use it. Um, so how can it be trustworthy? I think the number one rule, don't surprise the user. Don't do something that they don't expect. Um, one example of that would be don't share the contents of the conversation with people who they don't expect that conversation to be shared. So if you have a conversation between two people, um, generally speaking, no one else should be able to come back later and, and access that same conversation. It's really important, I think, as well, to help users make smart choices where it's required. So there's been a lot of debate about, as WebRTC has matured, as the standards have gone through, uh, as the browsers have adopted the standards, there's been a lot of discussion about how to request permission, when to request permission, for the camera right in Google does a really nice job, I think. If you ever go to a Google Hangout, you start a Google Hangout. When you first load the page, if you've not been there before, the first thing it asks you is, can I ask can I access your camera? Now, it does remember that. Um, I'll get to details about that later. But it does remember that you've granted access. But before it drops into the conversation, you see a picture of yourself that says, here's what you look like. Are you ready to go in? I think that's an important step, because what you don't want to do is jump into a conversation or, or somebody loads a site they've been to before, they've already granted permission, it takes you straight into the conversation and then they just realize that they're wearing pants. Um, that could be rather embarrassing. So doing things, little things like that to try to help you always feel fully in control of their communication is really important. And that is especially true with microphones. You know, at least on Macs, cameras have that little green dot that tells us that it's on. Microphones don't have such a dot. So there are plenty of examples where an application is listening, but you don't know it. Uh, that could be that can lead to some unhappy news. Another item about trustworthiness is identity. So identity, it's an interesting thing. There are lots of applications that make their name based on anonymity. That they, that there is no identity. That's an important use case. But for, I think, the average app, having identity is core to facilitating communication. You want to know who the other end of the call. We take caller ID largely for granted. You know, when a phone call comes in, I can look at the number and I can say, well, that's, you know, that's my wife, I know who that is. Um, in reality, caller ID is actually very, very easy to spoof. So the only reason that we don't see a lot more of that spoofing is just because of basically the carriers controlling the network itself. But anyone who gets a, uh, a certain kind of voice or IP connection or any kind of old PRI will be able to actually set the caller ID to whatever they want. I may or may not have But it, with web, we have a lot more uh, a lot, many more options for asserting identity. We have OAuth, we have social identity like Facebook and GitHub and, and Twitter, and we can actually use those to enhance the communication. And if your communication is built to the app, use the identity that comes from your app to, uh, to assert who the user is. And finally, these conversations should be referenceable. So, referenceability is, I think, all about sharing. Every conversation in my mind, should have a URL. This is an easy thing to do. We, we deal with resources and objects all day long, right? So every conversation has a URL that is permanent and unique. It represents the latest state of the communication request. So if you schedule a call, uh, then you should have, it should generate a URL that says this call will happen. If the call is going on and you hit that URL, really, it should bring you straight to the conversation. It should present the user interface that lets you be a part of, participate in that conversation, subject to a permission. Um, once the call is complete, then you should provide some kind of transcript, some kind of recording, maybe multiple content types. So if you record the call and you transcribe it, allow the option to download the audio as well as uh, search the transcript. 
any images or links that were shared can be combined into that view. But this idea of a single conversation can be referenced in a URL in all its forms. And then whenever possible, they get searchable and downloadable. Because if you don't know something's there and you can't find it, it may as well not be there. Uh, oh, and of course, it should be able to be shared. That's really one of the main points of having a URL, right? I can copy and paste it and send it to anyone. And assuming they have permission to view it, they'll be able to see it. So those are my five tenets. I want to try to apply those. I've got uh, three idea applications. And these are not necessarily great ideas by themselves, but I think they illustrate where you can take these, these tenets and these tools and embed them into to, to enhance uh, web applications today. So kind of a silly one. Uh, a live anonymous matchmaking service. Um, think Tinder, but video. So I got a funny date. You can kind of see we've got two people here who have video sessions going. Um, they've got some stats and how they were matched. Looks like they all like books, uh, mustaches, and puzzles. But these people also really want a sense of privacy. They don't necessarily want to share too much information about them. They certainly don't want to give off phone numbers. So not only did we give them the ability to find each other and communicate, we've also given them these uh, stickers that go over their face. Right? You've probably seen something similar with, with Google. Um, we can help them obscure some of their identity by giving them these tools where they can still get a sense of who each other is, they can hear their voice, they can see some of the expressions, um, but you can still hide some of that identity fairly effectively with a tool like this. So what does this give you? It gives you safe introductions with strict anonymity. Everybody comes to the site, the site only reveals what it's designed to do. Uh, no need to exchange phone numbers. There's a very low friction to getting people started. There's no app to download, there's no plugin to install. Um, really, just by going to the site, the entire toolkit of communication is built right in. And then we use silly tricks that can be used to break the ice or, again, to continue the anonymity. Um, and if you want, you can do an upsell. Skype just did their language translation, right? Why not apply that to, to, this, to this site, either by text or by audio? All right, so the second example is an incident response app. So my background, before I became a developer, I did a lot of ops. I did uh, server administration stuff. And this kind of thing, whenever something would go down, you get that, that phone call at 3 in the morning and some sort of thing down. Um, getting everybody in and on the same page is really a big challenge. So what if we could build something like this? What if we could build something that would enable people to not only discuss whatever is actually broken, but also bring in contextual information that's surrounding the problem? So, on the left, you can see the chat. Just like before, you, you can see where people are discussing the problem, and third-party services, the, the tan and green lines, third-party services are pushing in data. Um, the content there is important, but it's the idea that you know, anytime someone does a deploy, we can see the deploy was made. If there's an alert or monitoring system, it can be pushed into that text chat. Uh, on the right, you can see the voice and video conversation going on. And of course, the people who are joined by video will see each other, but there's, no, there's nothing to say that they couldn't also join by mobile device, by either by telephone call or by mobile app, say if they're in their car. Now what's really interesting, what makes this different than just any other communications app, is what's on the bottom. So what's on the bottom is charts, graphs, contextual data from the monitoring application itself. So rather than waiting for an event to come in, I can actually see trend lines happening in real time as part of the communications tool. So the way I envision this is that someone actually, maybe a company that builds monitoring tools, goes and builds this into their dashboard. I don't know, not here, so you can see that, whoever, whoever does this. So the, the key here is timely and contextual information. The view itself can adapt. If you're on a mobile device, you'll get a more focus on the communication and less of the dashboard type features, but on a desktop, you'll get the full, the full experience. I like, in particular, the emphasis on group-based communication. I can click a button and every one of the ops team gets an invite to join that particular conversation, the context about that conversation. But more importantly, if I need to bring in a vendor, maybe my storage vendor needs to jump in the conversation, I don't want to give him a user account in my system for that purpose. But we can generate this unique URL, uh, we'll have a token, he can come straight to that page, and he can join in that conversation and see what's discussed there without exposing any of my other conversations. Of course, we can better connect external services, like I mentioned. We can push in data from GitHub or, or Relic or whatever. Um, we can also record these instances and learn from them later. 
<clears throat> so once we've recorded it, we can actually tag back to our issue tracking system with a link to this conversation. So if something signals down the road breaks in a similar way, someone does a search and finds it, you can come back and find this original conversation and understand how this was resolved. Okay, my third example, uh, medical records, patient services. So imagine you have this very simplistic looking website and uh, if you want to see, you've been to the ophthalmologist, you want to see the advice the ophthalmologist gave you. So um, you actually, the, the, excuse me, this is a phone call. So you, you call the ophthalmologist, you talk to him, he gave you some advice. So the call was recorded, that recording is available for you as the patient to download this site. A transcript of that recording is there as well. And the doctor was actually able to go back and do annotations. So uh, last time I talked to the doctor, he used some words that I thought I knew how they were spelled, and I was wrong. And he was in, in this case, he could actually write them in, and I'd be able to find out more information on what those things are. In addition, there's another button here. If I've got a problem with my bill, or if I need to talk to an alcohol doctor because I have an allergic problem, I can click a button right here and immediately be connected with someone who already knows who I am, who has access to whatever information I was looking at when I initiated the call, whether that's a bill or medical information. Um, and, and I don't need to keep track of this phone number, I don't need to keep track of, of uh, any security information. I think in particular, the identity part of this is interesting because if you call your bank and they ask you for the same three pieces of information, your, your, your name, your account number, and the last four digits of your social, I mean, anybody can fake that, right? But if I have secure authentication to this website and I log in with my password, maybe two-factor authentication, and the rosy picture, that strong authentication is carried through to my voice conversation. So when I click that button and they, whoever takes my call takes my call, they know who they're talking to, much more so than somebody just memorized my social security. <coughs> so in the medical device use case, secure call authentication, I think, is one of the big deals here. You'll reuse the, authentic the primary authentication from the web app, maybe even verify. You can do voice biometrics, make sure that the person who's calling sounds like the person who's calling. You can even cross-check against location, which is not something you can really do with a telephone network today. And then you can automate the claims. So you've got the recordings and transcriptions available both to the patient as well as to the claims processing people. Any of the medical advice that's given, so that, that long string of, of things I should do three times a day that he gave me um, that I didn't write down because I was too busy listening, is all goes in the file. I can go back after and read it and find the It also gives you an easier way to do auditing service quality assurance. Okay, I hope I can put you to sleep. I have a demo. So this WebRTC thing is pretty cool. And I thought that if I could show you, it would be cooler. Alright, so over here we have what I like to refer to as a dangerous demo. And you can see I've got uh, Firefox running. Um, I built this really simple little Sinatra app. And all it's done so far is uh, connect to this page. Refresh. Okay, good. Um, so this is an example of WebRTC requesting permission from the, the camera. You may have heard me earlier mention that sites will remember this preference. The, the standard has fallen upon the, the idea that if a site is not using HTTPS, then it forces um, the request every time. So I'm running Sinatra locally, there's no certificate, so I don't have to accept it. If this were a site that had HTTPS, and then everyone should, everyone does, yeah, then it wouldn't run. Okay, um, so this is Chrome. So I've got, I'm sorry, this is Firefox. I've got Chrome over here, which you can't see. Um, I'm going to bring up the launcher. <laughs> now, what I've got for you is a rock. <laughs> and that rocket launcher has a camera on it. Now, what we have is, I'll show you the Chrome on this. So Chrome, uh, Chrome is right here. You can kind of see the video coming from uh, Chrome. And it's being transmitted to Firefox. Uh, now, these, both of these browsers are running on the local host, so the traffic is actually only going through loopback, even though the server is elsewhere. Um, the other thing I've set up is 
Google has this really cool speech API, and they expose it. Uh, there's a JavaScript library called Anyang, and Anyang is constantly listening. In fact, it's listening right now. If I do it right, now granted, um, this is demo, so it's probably going to blow up horribly, but if I, if I say the, the magic word, it should actually activate the launcher, then I should be able to talk to the launcher to steer it and fire it. Um, so let's see what happens. Weapons free. <laughs> Move left. Move left. Move left. I should have made it go further. I haven't cheated. Move up. <coughs> oh, I almost forgot. <coughs> This is a dangerous demo. <laughs> Move up. I'm going to break it. Move down. Fire. So the communications here is uh, the, the video is obviously WebRTC. The audio is um, is actually using a different browser extension, not browser extension, excuse me, a different JavaScript API. Um, that is Chrome only. The, the particular recognizer I'm using right now is Chrome only. But speech recognition can be done client side or server side. If you're using WebRTC, you can very easily call into something like FreeSwitch or Asterisk, do your recognition there. And then the last piece of it, which is just to move the launcher of the rockets, uh, is really nothing more than a curl request, uh, or in my case, just a uh, jQuery API call. Um, so that's really it. I mean, it's, there's nothing magic to it. But it's pretty fun. So with that, that is my presentation on WebRTC. I have a few... Um, I have a few resources for you if you'd like to know more about WebRTC. Uh, the first link in particular is great. It's what I used primarily when I was setting up my demo. It's the official set of samples from. It's the uh, official set of sample code from WebRTC.org. It's on GitHub. Um, a lot of the demos are alive, so if you go to this page, you'll be able to click through and actually start the video, and then every demo includes a link to the GitHub, to the source on GitHub. Uh, then the WebRTC.org itself is sort of the central point for WebRTC resources. I also want to point out an uh, initiative run by a friend of mine, Landry, who's actually based here in Atlanta, called the WebRTC Challenge. And his goal is to get one million developers who are using WebRTC by 2020. It's, it's a pretty audacious goal, I think he can do it. Uh, he's got some pretty interesting content with mailing list. Highly recommend it, if you want to check that out. A couple things I want to mention as well is uh, this being RailsConf, if you're interested in doing more voice with Ruby, definitely check out Adhesion. The, uh, it's the Rails-like framework for more voice. Um, I'll also point out Ruby Speech. If you do get into some of the more interesting speech recognition scenarios, Ruby Speech uh, is a library for generating the markup needed for driving synthesizers and recognizers. Um, makes that whole process a lot easier. The last bit is my contact information. I'm Ben Clay. Uh, that B Clay works on Twitter and GitHub. And of course, you can email me. Um, but with that, if you have any questions, I would love to answer them. Yes? Yeah, going back to your uh, the, uh, medical one, you talked about the audio recording. Yes. The connection of peer to peer and the angle of the curriculum. How exactly do we be able to save that? That's a great, that's a great question. So the question is if, uh, in the example with medical recording, if the if WebRTC does peer to peer encryption, if it's end to end encryption, how would the call be recorded? So the answer to that is that WebRTC can be peer-to-peer, -peer, but doesn't have to be peer-to-peer. -peer. So and this was, I, I kind of hinted at this earlier when I, when I said that if the architecture is built to enforce that, you can ensure it. Um, the simplest way to explain it is that if you have a media server in your network, something like FreeSwitch or Asterisk, it will participate as a WebRTC endpoint. So instead of going direct from from browser to browser, you go browser to free switch, free switch to browser. And then in that case, because you're decoding all the way there, you do it Yes? 
How do you handle the use case where the, the person on the other end stepped away from the computer, is not at the computer, whatever? Do you have options to like route over plain telephone, or you just take a voice message, or what are your options there? So the question is, if, you, if a user steps away from the computer, how do you deal with that? It sounds like, um, I guess, if they step away before a conversation happens or during a conversation. Yeah, maybe it's they're selling something on some site, and they aren't maybe yet at the computer, but okay. the person on the consumer wants to reach them. So you try, I say, okay, it's almost like a contact center scenario where the agent just walked away from the desk. Yeah. Okay. So in that case, um, I would probably make sure that the call that comes in gets routed for something that can make more intelligent decisions. So it might try WebRTC first, and then after five seconds it does the work, either try somebody else or try the cell phone. Um, Astros and FreeSwitch are both open source to let the engines. They both support WebRTC. If you take that call from WebRTC on the client side, once you get it into either of those, it can be converted to almost anything. It can be converted to more WebRTC, it can be converted to standard SIP, or, IP, or even to regular telephone network calls. So the, the same kind of rules that apply for hunting down context areas would apply in that case as well. If you really want to get esoteric, there are some uh, motion detection libraries from JavaScript that will actually, you know, if you wanted to, to detect the presence by looking at the camera, you can go that far. I'm not sure I recommend that. Um, but basically, anything you would do to detect you know, session activity timers, anything you would do to detect user's presence on one end, and use his input to some other decision making engine for our Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I promise I'll sit here. Yes? So, when you were first at that point, you wanted to say, you get the algorithm's location. So, are you asking uh, You're asking about the uh, IP? You're, you're asking, can I get the other person's IP address or I guess location based on the negotiation you're yeah. You could. So in that particular case, what you would have to do, I think about time, uh, what you would have to do is um, you'd have to control the negotiation between the two years such that you stripped out the person and identify all the information. You'd have to work with the partner server side to protect the other It could be done, but you're right away work on the models. If you're Depending on text that you're using and how strict your All right, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much. If you have questions.